Hey guys, what's going on? It's Michael from The Honest Youth Pastor back again with another sermon review. Today we're going to be looking at Sinclair Ferguson preaching on My Yoke is Easy. If you are new to this channel and specifically this series of sermon reviews, we look at sermon reviews each week from a variety of different pastors and say, hey, what can we learn from this pastor? Are there any red flags? Are there any good things? Are there what, what do we need to be listening for and looking for in a sermon to see is this is this accurate? Do they read scripture when they read scripture? Do do they talk about it uh, as far as context and language and pull that the truth of the gospel out and then apply it to the life of the believer today? Like what does that look like and are they doing that well? Because oftentimes we all know we have access to a variety of different sermons today because of the internets um and we can watch anybody but that doesn't mean just because somebody's preaching that it's good so the the goal of this series is to bring before you a variety of different pastors and sit down and walk through them for an hour and say what's good what's bad what do we need to look for what tools more, most importantly what tools can we use to determine if this is a good sermon or if it's not such a great sermon at all, we probably shouldn't listen at all. So today we're looking at Sinclair Ferguson, as I already mentioned. Uh, this is from October 4th, 2019, so it's a little old. But uh, I want to give you uh, a taste of something, you know, a little bit more biblically based. Oh, there are my cards on the table. Yep. So the last couple weeks have been uh, interesting. And those, you know, the ones that we do that are, um, you know, a little bit more controversial are usually the ones that aren't as biblically based as far as people just talking and adding things or weaving some things in. This is not to say that Sinclair Ferguson is the epitome of perfection in preaching, but I do want to show you like uh, a sermon. I want to lay before you a sermon that I, th I personally think is really, really good. And I want to walk through and show you kind of where that's good and where that's, you know, uh, things that we can apply and things that we can look for. So without further ado, let's hop into this sermon. Uh, if you want to watch this sermon without my commentary, as with all of the other sermon reviews that we look at, link will be in the description below. Uh, one thing I want to note just off, just off the bat before we even get into it. What I've been noticing is the more of these sermon reviews I do, there are like two, and I think I mentioned this a couple of sermon reviews ago, but there's like two distinctively different um, types. And I think we all know that, but we, we can almost pinpoint that by what we see on the screen as soon as we open up the sermon, right? So if we open it up and it's a guy in a suit, he's got a tie, he's dressed a little, you know, um, you know, a little fancier is that the word we want to use for it. Um, you can almost guarantee, not always, but usually there, there's much more of a, a structured, uh, expositional, exegetical preaching that's normally, now again, this is not at all because there's a bunch of probably fundamentalist Baptist preachers, um, independent of fundamentalist Baptist preachers that dress the same way and they're just way off the cuckoo end of the, of the preaching sphere. Like they're just way but by and large, that's usually an indication that, okay, maybe I'm going to hear something that's a little bit more based. That doesn't mean that, you know, people in leather jackets and button up plaid shirts don't do that because that's just untrue. There, 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 there are some good sermons there, but I've just, <laughs> I've just noticed this sharp contrast uh, of LED screens and button up plaids that you can go, okay, well, I'm definitely going to have to watch a little bit closer here. Um, with that being said, we, we need to make sure that we're doing this with everybody, regardless of who they are, what organization they're a part of. We need to apply these tools to everyone and not just sit back and assume that, well, this person is, you know, for this, from this organization, or they look like this and therefore they must be good. We need to make sure that we're applying all of them and recognize our, our sort of preconceived notions going into a sermon, if this is going to be good or not. Now. That has really nothing to do with this particular one, but I did want to bring that up because the more we do these, the more I see that. So let's hop into this sermon from Sir Ferguson Sinclair. It's 39 minutes in total. Um, all of these sermon reviews are an hour. We're not going to get through this whole sermon, but we're going to get through a pretty good portion of it. Um, so let's go. If I told you that I had spent time and knew uh, one of the most famous, instantly recognized people in the world. If you knew me well enough to invade my private space 
first of all, to ask me who that was on the assumption that the statement was true, I think you would then go on to ask two questions. The first would be, well, how long have you known them? Because that would be an indication of probably how well you knew them. And then the second question would be like unto the first question, you would say to me, what are they really like? What are they really like? Think about those questions in connection with our Lord Jesus Christ. How long have you known Him? Probably for many of us, relatively easy to answer. But the second question is a little more testing, isn't it? Tell me what He is really like. All right, so this intro is different than most of the intros we look at, right? So um, most of the time, whenever we hear a sermon, there's a, either, it, it usually is juxtaposed between either it's a story that intros into, you know, the, the sermon or the text. So it kind of kind of gives a, a sort of a, a real quick sort of easy way to understand the text we're looking at, or uh, it's just straight scripture and then you go into the sermon. Uh, Ferguson here is doing something ra rather interesting, though not entirely unique, but it's this presenting this question of, hey, you know how we talk about people that are famous or well-known, or maybe that you just are well-known within your circle, right? That you maybe don't have access to, but other people do. And he presents those questions of how long have you known them and what are they really like as common questions of connectors to those that are listening to this sermon saying, okay, yeah, these are these are the common questions that I would ask if it was somebody that you knew that I wanted to know, but I don't really necessarily have access to, or I don't know that well. And then he leads that into, okay, so let's apply those to Jesus. Now, this is sort of like uh, uh, the first example that I gave as far as people telling stories to bring you into the text, because he's obviously using this to bring us into a particular text, but he's doing that in such a way of this common communication, right? So if I know, um, I don't know, Kanye, right? Which I don't. But if I knew Kanye and you said, hey, how long have you known Kanye? I, 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 well, since I don't know Kanye, I don't, I wouldn't know at all. But 10 years, I know him for 10 years. All right. Well, what is he really like? The dude's straight up crazy, right? That would probably be how the conversation goes. Um, but he's using these common sort of conversational questions to now kind of bring us in to the text he's going to use here, which is helpful because now the things that I think often what happens is we don't necessarily connect like our everyday conversation or everyday life with how we interact with scripture in regards to these questions, right? So uh, we often think of Jesus or the apostles like as these far off people long ago, you know, connect, you know, far off centuries, like they're just not even connected to us. And though that's true, there is this reality that uh, Ferguson's kind of helping us come into through these questions and through his introduction in which he says, okay, so let's apply the things that we would normally ask of people here and now that maybe I knew that you didn't to Jesus in particular uh, in the circumstance we're going to be looking at in scripture. So I think it's, it's, again, not the greatest intro in the world, but it is helpful in kind of orientating our minds toward the text we're going to be looking at. So let's go. Tell me what he is really like. It's a question that uh, arose, isn't it, in the upper room in John 14, immediately following the words that Dr. Moeller was citing. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Uh, the question arises, uh, Jesus uh, shows the Father. Uh, this is a disciple who's been with Jesus, we think, for about three years, and you remember Jesus' response to him, have you known me so long time, Philip, yet you do not know who I really am? So, if a non-Christian asks you, indeed, if a Christian asks you, tell me what Jesus is really like. I don't mean give me the theology. That is to say the categories of interpretation. 
which I don't think anyone would doubt I regard as of immense value, but were to ask the question, what is he really like? Uh, how, how well would you do with the answer? Um, I was imagining a, a Bible study as Dr. Moller was speaking, um, in which the Bible study leader asked the question, what is Jesus really like? And I, I could see uh, Mrs. McDonald and her husband Joe in the corner smiling at one another, and Mrs. McDonald saying, well, and looking at Joe, who always does what Mrs. McDonald says, well, the way Joe and I like to think about Jesus is… And she has no idea. She's a child of the Enlightenment. All right, so real quick, one of the interesting things that he's bringing up here is that um, oftentimes whenever we do, there's like this dichotomy between the two. Whenever we're asked, you know, the leading question that he's leading into is what is Jesus like? We either go with the highly theological answers of, well, here's the doctrine, here's the theology, here's, here's the, the head knowledge I know, or he says, we go to this other spectrum where we say, well, to G Jesus to me is like, and then he's talking about the products of the Enlightenment, this idea that it's a personalized thing, it's, it's my interpretation, it's how I interact with. And he sets these two things up, and this is how you know, all right, this is how you know you have somebody that's been communicating for a long time, that is really good at communication, because he does that without naming that he does that. So, right, so he sets it up and says, if you were to ask me, you know, if I were to ask you rather, you know, what is Jesus like, you might go to the theological categories. But he doesn't break it down like many pastors today, or probably even I would, where he says, okay, so there's two ways to do this. We either look at it through the theological categories or we look at it through the enlightenment of asking how we interact with Jesus. And that's how normally I would set it up, right? I'd just name the categories. Here's this category, here's this category. And then I'd say, but it's not either one of those. It's, it's something, it's down the middle category. Uh, he doesn't state that. He just kind of weaves it together in a way to where we now know that there's two different ways of looking at this, but neither are great ways to do it because one is purely head knowledge. The other is purely speculative. Uh, and now he's going to use... Uh, those two examples that he's given to lead us in to a more scriptural way of saying, well, who is this Jesus and what does he look like? How does he interact with us? And it's hard for the Bible study to lead or de to say, dear, uh, the way you like to think about Jesus is utterly irrelevant. The real question is, what is Jesus really like? Not just how do you like to think about Jesus, but what is Jesus really like? And these verses at the end of Matthew chapter 11 stand out in Matthew's gospel. In a sense, they stand out in the synoptic gospels as a place in which in a very singular, striking way, the Lord Jesus Himself tells us what He is like this is what I am like. This is who I am. This is what you will find in me. This is what you will discover from me. This you will experience in me. This is Jesus' own answer to the question, Jesus, what are you really like? And I'm using the present tense. I'm not asking the question, what was Jesus like? I'm predicating the question on the basis of Hebrews 13 verse 8. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That is not longhand for Jesus is eternal, true though that is. That's a statement underlining that the Jesus of whom we read here in the Gospels as He was yesterday, from the perspective of the author of Hebrews, as He was yesterday, so He is today, and so He is tomorrow. So this is what Jesus is like. 
and He's inviting us in, as it were, into His own self-interpretation of who He is and what He is like. It's an astonishing statement, really. There's a, kind of, there's a kind of paradox written into the very things that he says about himself. He, he, is, he is meek and lowly in heart, and yet this is one of the places where he says, I am meek and lowly in heart. If I say that to you, I am meek and lowly in heart, you say to me, you are lying through your teeth or you would never say that kind of thing. You have no self-knowledge. But he is the one who has perfect knowledge of himself, opening himself to those who are listening to him, who are burdened and who are heavy laden, and he is, he is telling us who he really is. All right, so there's a couple of things that he set up here that I think are important just to note real quick. One, that the Jesus here is not, we're not getting this perception of who Jesus is from sort of some theological mining of the scriptures. This is actually Jesus' own words about who he is, which is important, Ferguson says, because these are his own words. This isn't speculation. This isn't, well, we're going to put these pieces together and guess. This is Jesus' own words of who he is, how he, how he interacts, right? Now, the interesting thing that he also adds here is that this is not only how Jesus, you know, was in the New Testament, but he's very careful to point out, as you probably caught there, that he's using the present term. This is how Jesus is, as in, and then he references the Hebrews verse in which to demonstrate that uh, even the author of Hebrews understands, or he's trying to at least um, to tell others that this is this continuation, like Jesus doesn't change. So if he was this way in the Gospels, he is this way now because Jesus is eternal. He is, he's alive today, which is this wonderful truth that you could preach a whole sermon on, but he wants to connect these two things. So the Jesus that we're about to read about, uh, the, the very things that he says about himself being true weren't only true then, but they're true now as well. And they're, they're truths that we can lean on and understand about and uh, interact with in a real way when we explain to others about who Jesus is. Not who Jesus was, but who Jesus is alive now. Um, and that's an important connection to make because uh, two things. One, this isn't us guessing. This is Jesus' own words. But two, this isn't something that, you know, well, this is how he was and this is how we should be. This is how Jesus is now. And this is the example we have now of who he is. So uh, interesting, uh, you know, things to bring out in this text here, especially the making sure that they understand that he's just not using the word Jesus is ambiguously. It's like he is this way now. We have scriptural uh, proof to point to to say that this is, you know, he doesn't change. These are his own words. This is how he is and has always been and will always be. And the, the implication of that is, is if, we, if we don't know him like this, we still do not know him. How long have I been with you? And yet you still do not know me, Philip. And the way, of course, that, that emerges in our lives is the degree to which we are unlike Him, because it's part of the dynamic of relationships between people, that the people we come to know best are the people that we become most like. So, how does Jesus tell us who He is? Well, let me pick out three of the strands of his teaching in these verses for us to explore together for a few minutes this morning. We, we know what Jesus is like, first of all, by the invitation that he offers us. The invitation is, come to me. But what's interesting about the invitation is those to whom the invitation is extended um, at times in my life, teaching in theological seminaries, I've had inquisitive students coming up to me and saying, if you were able to have a dinner party at the end of the week, then uh, which four theologians from the history of the church would you invite, usually kind of surprised by the people who would be at my table? And, you know, we, we'd all ask that kind of question, aren't we? 
famous sportsmen are asked, you know, if you had four of your kind, who would you invite? <coughs> now, look at Jesus' guests, those to whom the invitation goes. Come, he says, to me, you who labor and are heavy laden, you who are weary, you who are burdened. Eh, those are not the people you want as your dinner guests, because those people are enormously hard work. Those people are enormously difficult to love. Those people are enormously difficult to draw out, to unpick, to untangle the complexities that make them weary and heavy laden and burdened and sore. But Jesus says that's the people He wants to invite. It's amazing. It tells you so much about the kind of Savior He really is. And it's interesting just to think about this for a moment because the language he uses is deliberately general. We're not able to tell from this text exactly what was it that burdened these people, what was it that oppressed them and made them feel they were heavy laden, made them feel that they were somehow or another yoked to something that was uncomfortable and irritating and caused friction and distress. We can speculate what it was with these people can speculate that they are socially oppressed, they're, they're under Roman domination, that they're oppressed by taxation and by tax collectors. We can, we can speculate on that, and that they are burdened because they are conscious that they cannot live up to the law of God, never mind the Pharisees' interpretations of the law of God. And I can imagine in our world, people might read a passage like that and say, well, that was fine for them, but it's no longer fine in our society because we have got rid of the law of God. But as you remember, the Apostle Paul points out on more than one occasion when he's writing to Gentiles who do not have the law of God, his basic response to them is, you may not have the written law of God but you cannot escape having been created as the image of God. And so long as you're the image of God, created to function according to the law of God, then there will manifest itself in your life the same kind of weariness, the same kind of burden because of what the Scriptures call your sin and your iniquity, your transgression, your rebellion, or what you may experience as your failure. All right, so he uh, opens up. That was a long thing there, but I wanted to make sure he played it all the way out. So he brings up that Jesus, the kind of people that Jesus invites unto himself, right? The weary, the broken, the heavy laden. And he, he carefully unpacks this in a way that is, isn't presuming who Jesus is necessarily talking about. In fact, he, he points out and says this is generalized language, probably for a reason, because this is a vast category of different people. He brings up, for example, there's probably people that are under taxation, under people that are under Roman oppression, people that are under the, uh, and understand that they can't live up to the law of God, and nevertheless, the, the things that the Pharisees have added on to it. But he does this really particular thing that he says that there's still going to be people that think that, that, okay, well, that was then, that isn't now. And then he carefully points us to Paul and just the basic sin nature of all humanity, even those that are, have never heard of, um, of the law, uh, they don't have the law. And he says that, you know, just the weight of sin itself is enough to weigh us down to where we are burdened. We are heavy laden. Even if we don't know where that comes from, what that looks like, the very fact that sin is in our lives, there is this heaviness, this, is this burden. So he connects the two, to even the people that would say, well, okay, I know who Jesus is talking about, but he goes, well, this is actually all of us that Jesus calls, because we are all, you know, the, the heavy, the burden, the the outcast. But he does this thing at the very beginning that I don't want to, I don't want to skip over, where he go, he, he points out the reality of how hard 
those people are, how hard we are to, to deal with. But yet Jesus is the one, these are the people that Jesus calls. We are the people that Jesus calls to us. The ones that are really hard to untie, to figure out, the ones that have a lot of work to be done in their lives to, to, to help us understand maybe even what the burden is that we're under. We just feel it. And he does a really good job, I think personally, of saying, okay, well, these are the people that Jesus calls. These are the ones that he says he calls himself. And these are the ones that are really really people would avoid to call. Then he moves into, so even if you don't think you're part of this category, and this was a then, here is he, here we are, all of us, is, it's just image barriers of God that are under sin, that we are all these heavy, laden, burdened people. But this is who Jesus calls unto himself, the complicated, the difficult, the tangled mess of emotions and ideas and past. And this is who Jesus calls, which is this really, wonderful truth when we talk about who is Jesus, which is what he's doing. He's saying, you know, if somebody asks you, how long have you known Jesus? Who is Jesus? And he says, these are Jesus' own words. This is who Jesus is. Jesus is the one who calls the difficult, the, the burden, the heavy laden, and we fit that category. You fit that category. This is who Jesus calls the difficult ones, <laughs> the complicated ones. The, the ones that are going to take a long, long time to get all that worked out. He says, this is who Jesus calls. This is who Jesus is. So I just want you to see kind of how he he's worked through all of that, right? In, in a really good way. This is why I want to present to you this sermon. Again, he's not the pinnacle of all pastors. I've, I've only heard really a handful of sermons from Ferguson, but I thought this one was a really good example of you can tell a good communicator by their way they can communicate ideas without even you knowing that they're doing it right which is what he just did here just specifically with this verse and i think as pastors we can take a lot of um, if you're a pastor we can take a lot of notes from this that there's a lot of things being said that aren't necessarily being labeled and said outright but are just being communicated in an understandable way that are addressing um, maybe the arguments that would come to his point, but he's addressing them as he talks through them. So just as a note for pastors, I think this is a really good example of being able to not only communicate an idea, but to address what you assume is going to maybe be the rebuttals to that idea as you address it. So uh, hopefully that's understandable. But um, so anyway, that's what he, this is where we're at so far. Hey, Jesus calls the heavy, the burdened, right? Um, it, to which we are all a part of. We're all part of that group. Um, in a very general way, and Jesus uses general language for that reason. And it's interesting, isn't it, when people have the integrity, as some academics have had, to bring out the statistics that result from our throwing away the law of God, and all the energy and the expense that now goes into teaching young people who have no sense of who they are, because they've never been reared in the undergirding significance of being created as the image of God for the joy of God, for the presence of God, and for the glory of God. Every single substitute that our Western governments put in its place, you can be anything you want. You are a prince. You are a princess. Billions in the Western world spent on raising people out of their sense of failure and simply accelerating their sense of failure. I rather suspect there has not been so much self-harming in the Western world since there were monks living in monasteries seeking to deal with their sinfulness by self-harming. And while the world knows it by other names, it's exactly what Jesus is speaking about here. And if you think of the order of these messages this morning, you can see the coherence of this, that there is no other one in whom dignity can be restored, from whom burdens that we feel can be taken away than the one who is meek and lowly in heart and who is able to give us rest for our souls. 
So two things to note here. One, he talks about that the messages this morning he just referenced. I'm assuming this is part of a, a larger sort of um, lecture series or part, part maybe a, a conference. I'm not sure, to be honest with you. But one thing he does point out that I think is important that we need to note here is that by and large, those outside of the church, he's connecting this obviously to the point he just made before, those that are outside of the church understand that there is a heaviness and a brokenness and like this weight on people but they address it differently than how Jesus is, is addressing it, right? So Jesus is calling the broken, the heavy laden to himself, uh, and he's going to give rest to those that come to him. Whereas, he says, juxtapositioning the idea that the world in, in, in self, it tries to build people up and build them out and say no, and try to encourage them out of this heaviness, this burden, um, by maybe self-help or self-enlightenment or making, you know, you know, you're not really, you know, you're, you're good. You're good. We can figure this out. Uh, and he said that these are, these are two different ways of doing it. Um, which is important to point out. I think oftentimes, um, we'll address one issue when we preach as far as, okay, well, here's what the scripture says. And we don't give the juxtaposition of, well, this is what the world says. And then show that Jesus is the better way. Um, I think we, we, we do a decent job of that, but most of the time it's just demonizing the culture, demonizing the world, instead of just saying, okay, well, here are the two ideas, and I can assure you Jesus is the better way here, which is what Ferguson is setting up, that Jesus is calling those to him that are heavy and burdened, and he's going to move on here to, I will give you rest, um, whereas the world, he says, offers this, you know, if you throw religion and law away, you, you have to build yourself up. Uh, he's just showing the differences here in, in these two ideas. From our sense of failure, from our sense of guilt. This is a wound our society cannot heal, and the more the individual and the society seeks to heal it by its self-inventions, the worse it makes the wound. The harder becomes the yoke to bear. And our grandchildren were eyes to say that we cannot bear this burden that our grandparents and parents have placed upon us. So it really means something special to us to be Christians in this world, to know that Jesus is the light of the world, that Jesus alone is the one in whom true truth can be found and to whom we can come because He invites those who are burdened and heavy laden to come to Him. He will give us rest. I was, happened to be reading a book by Dr. R.C. Sproul uh, a couple of weeks ago and came across this nugget. Those of you who ever heard him knew he was the kind of man to whom things happened. There are some preachers to whom things happened and they see it, and there are more preachers to whom things happen and they don't see it. And so it never appears in their illustrations. And he was telling a, a story that I'd never heard from him, that at one point a psychiatrist with a very large and successful practice had offered him a job and a fortune to take the job in his psychiatric practice. Now, Ferguson here, and I want, I want to stop this before we get too far into this, because I want you to recognize what's happening in case, you're, in case you miss it. So, I've said before that, ser that sermon illustrations or sermon stories can be, if done well, very effective in demonstrating the point you're just trying to make. So we have to understand that he's making this point from Jesus saying he's these are the type of people that Jesus calls. He's already initiated that. These are the, the ones that are heavy and burdened and they're under taxation and they're under Roman oppression and they're under the law. And there's just all of these things that are affecting their life in a very burdensome, heavy way that they need rest from. He's then initiated that the world understands that this is a thing, but they deal with it differently and that Jesus is the better way to, uh, Jesus is the better way. Jesus is the only one that can actually take care of this. He doesn't make it worse. He makes it better. Whereas the world's problem just puts more burdens on in an attempt to ease the burden. It just makes it heavier. Now, what he's going to do here is tell a story by way of a story that R.C. Sproul tells in one of his books that demonstrates this point uh, out to show both the cultural and the biblical way of looking at things and how even in culture, many people understand that the way that they're doing it isn't necessarily working that well. So I want you, I want to set up that story so that when he tells the story, you can kind of see how stories can be used well in order to point back to 
the point that he's trying to make about who Jesus calls and what that looks like and why Jesus is the better way. So that all set up, let's get into the story. And R.C. said, but I'm not a psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist said, that doesn't matter. He said, about 95% of my patients do not need a psychiatrist. They need a priest who will tell them how to find the forgiveness of their sins the release from their shame and their guilt that will deliver them from the burden that is crushing them, that my colleagues mis-exegete and therefore misfunction in their diagnosis and in their prescription. And it's in the papers all the time, isn't it, in the NHS, that the burden about over-prescription of drugs it's partly a financial matter, but it's more than a financial matter. It's the recognition that actually, unless the problem is biochemical, putting chemicals in is not going to heal the problem. But here is our Lord Jesus Christ. One day He will remove all these burdens. One day we will no longer be weary. Even the oldest person in the room will no longer be weary. But even now, he says, if you're burdened, heavy laden, come to me, and I will give you rest. And that, of course, is the second thing to notice that he says. There's the invitation that he offers us, and then there's the promise that he makes. So I just want to make sure before, because he's going to move into this, this second part here, where then I will give you rest, which... Uh, it's, it's a shift in sort of moving on through this text, but I want you to see that, that, that story, that illustration, really. I mean, it's more of a story than an illustration, but to demonstrate that, uh, one, he was very careful to note that unless there's a biochemical thing that needs evened out with, with medication, that oftentimes, as the, in the story, the psychi psychiatrist told Sproul, that my, my patients don't need more medicine. They need, they need to get to the, the depths of what is actually causing this burden and how they can be freed from this, um, which is often misdiagnosed. So, you know, you have some people that don't have a chemical imbalance that are depressed, and you just give them more medicine. And he says that Jesus they, they need Jesus. They don't need more medication. Now, again, I want to point out that Ferguson is very careful to note that there is a distinction here, uh, which is, is helpful when he's talking about this because he doesn't just throw it all out the window. Um, but he, he points to that. And that story sums up what he's been saying, that Jesus is the better way. Jesus is the only one that can, that can ultimately take someone's burden and care and heaviness from them. Um, by way of, of who he is. Now, he's going to move on to I give you rest here, which is the second part of it, which is uh, incredibly important as well. But I want you to see kind of that flow there, right? He could have easily just said, these are the people that Jesus takes on, the oppressed, those that are under Roman oppression, those that are under taxation, those that are under the law. But Jesus says he'll give them freedom. And he could have just moved right on. But he's very careful to go through, and this is what I really want you to see, the layers that are there. Uh, whether they be the religious layers, the, psycho the psychology, the sociology, like all of these different layers of, the, of who is in this category of oppressed and heavy and burdened um, so that we can unpack that a bit and say, okay, well here, this is like, these are big categories, but regardless of the category, Jesus is the, the best way, the better way. The, the one that can lift all of this, regardless of what layer we're looking at, Jesus is the answer. And what is Jesus' answer? Well, I will give you rest. And this is the part that we're moving into now. Next to us, I will give you rest. I will give you rest. What does he mean? I'm, I'm, back, to the, I'm back to the same question. I know what he says, but what does he mean? And I, I hear Mrs. MacDonald again saying, well, the way, the way Joe and I like to think of, about it is, and I'm usually too embarrassed to say, go and make the tea. <laughs> so what does Jesus mean? How would we find out what Jesus meant? How would you find out what Jesus meant when he said, come to me and I'll give you rest? Not by looking up the dictionary, 
but by coming to understand Jesus' biblical theology. So, let me take a few minutes to, to delve into the way in which I believe Jesus must have understood the Scriptures that enabled Him to say, I exclusively will give you rest, and when I say rest, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, so this is um, incredibly helpful, and I think especially for pastors, this will be helpful as far as to see what Ferguson is going to do here, because what, what, what almost always happens is that we'll either look up, you know, the definition, the Greek word, what the definition of rest is, or we'll point to all these other places where rest is mentioned. But what Ferguson is going to do here is is incredibly helpful in in setting sort of the showing how how would have Jesus understood it, right? Because Jesus understands the Torah, he understands the Old Testament. I mean, apart from the fact that he's he's God and he's he knows all things, uh, he he has a scriptural understanding of what rest looks like, how God has set up rest, what that means, and that's. It's altogether different from us doing like a word study on what rest is, right? There's, there's so much more there than just saying, well, here's the Greek word or the Hebrew word for rest. This is what it means. This is where all the different places in Scripture it's mentioned. Like, that's helpful. That's a big, that's a start. But I want to watch, like, watch very carefully kind of how Ferguson walks through this and kind of unpacks this to say, Jesus would have understood rest to mean this, which means that if he understands rest this way, when he says, come to me, you are, you guys who are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, this is what he means. But we, this, this is really important, I think, for us as pastors especially, but just as congregants as we're listening, to, to, to listen for and to watch for, like, it's really easy to be like, well, here's the definition, so this must be what it means when there's so many more layers to it than that. So let's, let's watch him unpack this. Because rest, if you think about it, rest in God, the rest of our souls that we abide in God, and the resting of creation so that it functions as a perfect creation of God where, where there are where there are no irritations uh, in the way in which the cosmos functions. Uh, rest was how God created the world. Indeed, He created the world with so much rest that on the seventh day He was able to rest, wasn't He? But I wonder if you ever thought about it like this. The day of rest which was the seventh day, was Adam's first day. Isn't that right? He was created on the sixth day. He apparently went to sleep twice. One occasion, this beautiful woman appears. The other occasion, the seventh day appears. And he begins his life resting. You know, many of our forefathers believed it was on the day of rest that Adam fell, the very first day. Man did not abide for a single day was the text they tended to hang it on. And actually, the narrative gives you that impression, that he is created in a world that is functioning so beautifully. He's given this woman to live in harmony. He's given this world to enjoy. He is told that there is work to do because he's put in a garden and he's to extend that garden to the ends of the earth, and the next day is the Sabbath. And it's a kind of indication to them that they're to live the whole of their working life with their family extending the garden to the ends of the earth out of a position of rest. And we even understand that, don't we? That it's only from a strong position of stability and rest that we can create energy and force. Otherwise, everything is unstable. And so, from one point of view, we might say that in the sights and the crosshairs of the serpent, there is the destruction of the rest. 
the harmony between them and the Heavenly Father, the harmony between each other, the harmony between them and the cosmos. And the whole of the rest of the Bible narrative is a story of the restlessness of our sinful condition with the promise that one would come who would bring rest. It would be, it would be a rest that would be bought at a bloody price, Genesis 3.15. And you remember a couple of chapters later on when Noah's parents have their baby boy, you remember why they called him Noah? The name Noah sounds very like the Hebrew verb for rest. And do you remember what they said about him? Perhaps this is the one who will bring rest. And they weren't just making that up. They were understanding what they knew of divine revelation. God had promised a redeemer, a conqueror, who would restore rest, and they were desperately hoping their baby boy might be that seed of the woman who would bruise and crush the head of the serpent, even as his own heel was crushed and bruised. And there was a sense in which, out of judgment, there was a new rest created through Noah but it disintegrated again. Remember how the picture of the exodus is of God bringing them out of their bondage under the yoke of slavery. You see that background in what Jesus is saying here, and He brings them into the land of rest. He makes a covenant with them, and isn't it, it's, it's often a puzzle to people, why is it that the sign of that Mosaic covenant is what? It's the Sabbath, not just the weekly Sabbath, but the, the Sabbath Sabbaths, the six years and then the seventh, and then the, the seven seven years and the year of Jubilee. And, and what God is doing is creating for them a kind of pop-up picture book in which they can't move in the week or in the years or in the half centuries without being reminded that what God has promised in His great gospel promise is that He will bring rest. But all of these things are but signs of a reality that is not fulfilled in the Exodus. Remember how Isaiah gives the interpretation of it in Isaiah 63, how the Spirit brought them into a land of rest, but they rebelled against Him. And uh, just as we sometimes sing at Christmas, if we sing Christmas carols, O little town of Bethlehem, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. And when Jesus says, come to me, you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, He's saying the hopes and the fears of all the centuries, the fulfillment of all the promises. I am the one in whom the promises of God are yes and amen. And this promise that God gave in Genesis 3.15, His oldest promise in Scripture, His most difficult to keep promise in Scripture, His longest lasting promise in Scripture, is being fulfilled in me. I am that rest to which all those shadows pointed. You remember how in Luke's gospel… When so real quick, he's going to move, he's going to keep going here, but I want you to see that, what, what he kind of just did there. Um, oftentimes, so to pastors real quick, I think oftentimes we think we have to hurry through situations, like through uh, examples or illustrations or sort of the line of thought from one place to the other, because most of the time, like, there's a time that we have to do this. And this, this goes back to points I've made before about, you know, deciding, making a, a conscious decision of how much you're going to cover on a given Sunday morning. Because sometimes we bite up these huge chunks. And because we have such huge chunks of scripture to get through, then we have to move really fast in order to hit all the points we want to within this huge section. Uh, what I want to notice here is that Ferguson um, has bit off a pretty small chunk of scripture. Basically just come to me, all those that are burdened, heavy laden, I will give you rest, which is a really, it's just like a verse, but there's so much in this verse and he's given himself enough time to carefully walk through and talk about 
This is what rest looks like. This is how Jesus would have understood it. This is how the people Jesus is talking to would have understood it. And then he walks through the Old Testament demonstrating what rest would have looked like, how they would have understood it, how it's, how they would have put their hopes in things before or people about this could be the rest and how that's all falling apart. And how Jesus is now saying a pretty big statement that, again, if we were just say, well, this is what rest means, this is what the Greek rest means, this is what Jesus is saying he brings, that we would overlook and miss that there's a lot more impact here. And this is what Ferguson is able to do as he walks us through the Old Testament, giving us examples, and then brings it back to Jesus, where he says, when Jesus is saying rest, this is how he would have understood it. This is how his hearers would have understood it. And it means a huge, I mean, it's an impactful statement. That he's saying that all of those that are burdened and heavy laden, when you come to me, I will give you rest. What kind of rest? This rest that you've been looking for for centuries that has been promised. This is in me, which is this is a much bigger statement as we understand it as pertaining to pointing back to the hopes of the Messiah coming. And Ferguson is able to take the time and unpack that for us, which I think is for those that as, as, as we sit in the congregation is important to look for. It's one thing to just to make a statement about this is what Je Jesus by rest. He's pointed to the fact that he is the Messiah, that he's the one that can bring the ultimate rest. That's one way to do it. But we also need to look for, you know, do you point back and give indications and examples and walk us through that in a way that we understand it? Because it's one thing to make a statement. It's a totally different thing to, to help us as congregants understand what's behind that statement, which is what Ferguson did. So I really want to point that out. Uh, I'm gonna, we're getting real close to the hour marks. So what I want to do is let him finish this last point, and then we'll kind of wrap this up. When he's discussing with Moses and Elijah significantly, the, the death is going to die in Jerusalem. Remember how Luke uses the word, the exodus that he would accomplish. Because he's going to bring rest. Now, how does our Lord Jesus bring rest? Well, there are, there are two aspects to the way in which he does it, aren't there? He does it, first of all, by entering into the deepest darkness of our restlessness. And the, the gospel writers, especially Mark, bring this out in very powerful terms. As, they, as, as Mark sees Jesus going into the Garden of Gethsemane and describes Jesus' experience in the Garden of Gethsemane, he uses violently emotional language about what Jesus was going through. His soul was sorrowful, troubled. And, and Mark says that, that Jesus began to be filled with sorrow and was greatly distressed. I've never forgotten the day when I was a, a student, um, and I came across uh, a great Anglican scholar from the 19th century, totally sane New Testament scholar of legendary ability and status. And he comments on the fact that the very same verb is used in Philippians chapter 2, verse 29 of, a, of Epaphroditus. who was sick out of his mind because he'd heard that his own people had heard that he was sick. He was like your mother. Your, your, your mother was more worried that the family were worried that she was sick than she was worried about being sick. And Paul uses exactly the same verb, and, he, and here's what this level-headed Anglican scholar said. He said, this verb describes the overwhelmed, half-distracted state that emerges from physical derangement or mental oppression. I think that's why the gospel writers are at pain to point out that Jesus fell on the ground. And when you watch Him in the Garden of Gethsemane, there's a there is, a, there is a certain sense, and actually it's accentuated after the angel comes to strengthen him. 
that he is undergoing a restlessness of an unfathomable, unparalleled nature. And the reason, of course, is he's just given the cup of blessing to his disciples in the upper room. And he's just taking from his father's hand the cup his disciples should be drinking, the cup of that terrible restlessness that is the fruit of sin, and he's tasting it to a level none of us has begun to taste it. It's, it's as though he needs to go into the darkest chamber of human restlessness in order to, in his active obedience, take that upon his own shoulders in order, in order of himself to have tasted the fruit of our sinfulness and our restlessness, and on his own shoulders yoked to him, bring us back to rest in God. And of course, He not only does that, but on the cross He deals with the cause of that restlessness. As Isaiah saw, He would be wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement that would bring us peace, shalom for our restlessness, He tasted. All right, so uh, if you're wanting to continue this sermon, which I would highly encourage you to do, we stopped at uh, minute 29, uh, 29 minutes and 18 seconds. So that will be the link in the description below if you want to finish that or pick up kind of where we're stopping here or just watch the whole thing. It'll be down there. But I want to sum up real quick. Um, one of the things that we're seeing in this sermon that I think uh, just is just pastors and congregants that we can both take away is that uh, it's, of in great, it's a great help to take the time to slowly walk through what the text is saying so that we can better understand what is happening in that particular text. Now, obviously, with every text, this wouldn't be necessary um, so much, but uh, it's very helpful in this particular text to see what Jesus is saying about himself in regards to, come to me, all who are heavy and uh, burdened, and I will give you rest. And unpacking all those different layers of what burdened looks like, what what heaviness looks like, not only not only in Jesus' day, but Ferguson does a really good job of kind of bringing it to our day and demonstrating that the world even now is trying to answer that question that can only be answered in who Jesus is. But how can it be answered in Jesus is the question, and it's that Jesus will give rest. And that's kind of the pivot that we saw here in the sermon, that we acknowledge like that there, there's this burden, there's this need that can only be met in Jesus, but Jesus meets that need in coming and giving us rest. And just that great unpacking that we saw there through the Old Testament of this, this always being the want, this rest, this promise, this this Messiah to come and take it and kind of the indications throughout the Old Testament of what, you know, their understanding of maybe this is the rest, maybe this is the rest, but that ultimately falling apart and then coming to Jesus being the ultimate rest. And then just this last part that I think is really good and which I think you, why I think you should finish the sermon in the link in the description below, but where Ferguson is unpacking what that looks like for Jesus to come into our restlessness and give us rest, like this trade that happens um, and I think he did a really good job. Like, and I don't know if I've ever heard anybody kind of describe it this way before, but where Jesus uh, gives the disciples the cup of fellowship and actually takes the cup of wrath upon himself. And that whole, um, what's happening behind the scenes there that we see in scripture, but we, we often read over are these things that can only be really brought out in sermons in which you say, here's the verse, let's take our time with it. And I think oftentimes what we see is, especially as pastors, I do this a lot, I've seen this a lot in modern day preaching, is where we try to take this big section of scripture and then, you know, drill it down. And it's just too much scripture to drill down and look and say, well, this is the main point. When there's really all of this going on culturally behind it, their understanding of what these words mean, and then we try to apply it way too quickly to ourselves. And in doing so, we really misapply it, make it about us. And what we see here in this sermon that uh, Ferguson's giving is that it's there's so much behind the meaning of what this what this rest looks like for those that are heavy and burdened and laying with all of this these layers that we looked at um, that 
like to understand what it means to have rest in Jesus, to understand what Jesus is saying when he says, come to me and I will give you rest. We have to understand the background here and ultimately how great that rest is. So that being said, guys, thank you for joining us again for another sermon review. Really appreciate it. If you found this helpful, make sure you like it, comment it, share it, do all the things that feed the algorithm so more people can see it. I appreciate you guys uh, being here, taking the time to go through this with me. I'll talk to you next week.